Uh, this is going to be really cool. You guys are going to like this podcast a lot because you've got a great story. It's a very interesting story from the researcher and the writer and the book that he wrote um, is going to be something that uh, you're going to learn a lot from about the family, where the family went, how big the family is, and all the money and, and wealth that was created by exceptionally hard work. Of course, before I get into this, I want to thank my friends at the Tombstone Epitaph, Arizona's longest running newspaper. <clears throat> you can uh, you can find it at tombstoneepitaph.com. Uh, one year is 25, three years is 60. Just do the three year because if you do year to year to year, it's going to cost you 15 bucks more. And I don't know about you, but if I found 15 bucks in the parking lot, I'd pick it up. And uh, I'd go to In-N-Out Burger and, and, and have lunch. But again, go to tombstoneepitaph.com. I also want to thank my friends at the Wild West History Association. Do you know what? Join, subscribe, or join. You get the 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 journal delivered right to your door. It's 75 bucks, and uh, it's a phenomenal journal. It's 100-plus pages. It's a mini book, and you get so much. Uh, you get to meet wonderful writers and historians like John Bosnecker and Peter Brand and Linda Womack, and oh my gosh, there's so much. So make sure that uh, you check out the Wild West History Association at wildwesthistory.org. Also, they are everywhere on social media. So check them out at Wild West History Association on YouTube. You also want to see them over on Instagram. My buddy uh, 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 over there is running the, the Instagram page and Dave Guyton. And also you can find them on Facebook. So you have YouTube. You have Facebook, you have Instagram, you've got the journal, you've got everything um, with a membership. You are going to be immersed. You're going to be covered in Wild West history. If you go to the wildwesthistory.org and join and become a member. So the gentleman we have today, his name is Matthew Bernstein. And Matt, uh, do you go by Matt or Matthew? Oh, I go by Matt. Okay, so Matt kind of crossed my path because he wrote a book. It's called George Hurst, Silver King of the Gilded Age. And I was fascinated by the book because for me, I don't know anything about George Hurst. Mostly what I know, which is very little, is about his son, William Randolph Hurst. Um, if you've uh, gone up to San Simeon, which is in Northern California, and seeing the Hearst Castle, that's, you know, that was all part of the Hearst legacy. And George wrote, a, not George, but Matthew wrote a book about George Hearst, which is phenomenal. But Matthew's also got a crazy, amazing story. And I, you guys are going to want to hear it. Now, I, I don't know where he's born and raised. Hopefully he can share that. But he, he is a hiker and he's an avid hiker. And he is, you're hiking the Pacific Coast Trail, right? The PCT? That's right. I'm uh, 435 miles into it so far. So do you, so welcome first off, and thank you for being here. When Oh, it's good to talk to you, Mike. So how does a guy in Los Angeles, do you, are you biting off the PCT all in one bite or are you breaking it up in sections? Oh, I'm what's called a section hiker, uh, and it's mostly because my hiking partner and I work full-time jobs. So, you know, we can kind of use my spring break, and I'm a, you know, high school teacher slash uh, adjunct uh, college professor, you know, so the time's a little difficult, but we can use my spring break, my summer, my Thanksgiving break. And she works in Hollywood. Uh, she does background and stand in for NCIS LA. Ooh. So she sometimes has what she calls a hiatus. When the show wraps, it's like, okay, suddenly she's got a lot of time on her hands. And we try to like juggle it well enough that we can be like, okay, we can do three nights here, four nights there. And the PCT does run through the Angeles National Forest, which is kind of in our backyard. So we're able to do some stuff, which is just uh, day hikes. Uh, but it's a lot of fun. It's uh, sometimes uh, rather difficult just to kind of like 
put together the puzzle, but that's also the entertaining uh, point where you figure out like, okay, we're going to drive to say Cooper Canyon and we're going to leave our cars here and, you know, or leave one car here, uh, jump into my car, drive like 30 miles in one direction, plant the car there, and then we're going to hike to the other car um, over mm-hmm. a course of a number of days. And you got to figure out how much water, how much food. Is there water along the way that we can use our water filters, you know, like get water from creeks, uh, where we're going to camp, um, are we going to bring it? cookware, all that sort of stuff. And uh, it keeps us happy, healthy, and entertained. Because the only section that I've hiked is a very small section, because I am not a hiker, but I like to get out, is the area around Wrightwood, California. Oh, uh, yeah, Wrightwood's great. Yeah, and up around um, Highway 2 and in those areas. And I've hiked a little bit of the PCT, so at least I feel like I've you know, if somebody says you hike the PCT, well, yeah, dude, like, absolutely. I don't want to tell them it's only been a mile, but, you know, <laughs> at least I can say, you know, been there. But that's in when I lived in Southern California, so I get that. But you didn't just do the PCT because you've also hiked Mount Whitney. I think that's, what, 14,000 feet? Yeah, just about 14,500, give or take a couple feet. But... Then you did Kilimanjaro, and what I read about you was, I think that was in 2019. How in the heck does a guy from L.A. end up hiking Kilimanjaro, and how high is that? Like, tell us a little bit about that. Oh, I think, I don't have it on um, top of my fingertips, but uh, it's about 19,000 feet, if I remember right. And uh, Whitney's uh, fourteen thousand five hundred or so, um, so it's it's much more uh, difficult. But okay, so my hiking went where I think I was in about sixth grade or so, and I was born in Camarillo, California, yeah. uh, which is in Ventura County, mm-hmm. and nice upbringing. And in the sixth grade, there was some sort of field trip where everybody basically goes camping. They put you on buses, and I forget where they sent us. It might have been Big Bear or somewhere far away. And it was the first, like, camping trip I'd done without, you know, my parents or, you know, my best friends there. And one of the things we did is we hiked a mountain. Now, I don't remember it terribly well. It might have been, like, a four-mile round trip, uh, but... As soon as I did it, as soon as I got to the peak, and there's also some incidents with like trying to avoid poison ivy. So there was like an element of danger that I was usually not familiar with in my uh, small experience life at that point. I was just in love with the idea of hiking. Uh, and soon thereafter, national parks became just a passion with me. It became my goal to hike in every national park. And when I went to national parks, the thing I wanted to do most was hike the high peak in the park. Mm-hmm. Um, so California is wonderful in that we've got, I think, nine national parks now. You know, there's Death Valley and Joshua Tree and Pinnacles and Yosemite, right. on and on and on. And you're you're surrounded by nature. You've got all sorts of uh, wonderful stuff you can do. There's kayaking in the Channel Islands. Uh, Mount Whitney is actually in Sequoia National Park. When you hike Mount Whitney, you actually hike into the park. Um, so eventually it became, all right, uh, I was a small time peak bagger. Nothing like, uh, you know, like free solo. I wasn't, you know, doing things where it's like, if I plummet, you know, I die. You do get into some hairy spots, but, mm-hmm. you know, it's usually fairly safe. Uh, but, Eventually, you know, having hiked uh, the high peak on in the continental United States, it got to the point where I was like, all right, uh, what are some other cool hikes? And my hiking partner and I set our sights on Kilimanjaro, and we had the most fantastic time uh, I could imagine. Um, you know, it was something like 
seven days on the mountain. Um, the last day, you know, like you hike the peak at midnight is when you begin. And it was under a strawberry moon. And, you know, when we got down, we, we felt like we were going to die. Um, but there was just all sorts of excitement and uh, happiness and joy with it. And that's one of the things I get out of uh, bagging peaks. Um, and then the pandemic hit. And so we realized if we had just put it off one more year, mm-hmm. we may never have done it. Right. So we were also very happy that we were able to slip that in. That is so cool. So if you're wondering, we're talking to Matthew Bernstein. He is the writer, researcher, historian uh, for the book George Hurst, George Hurst, Silver King of the Gilded Age. Now you can find it at booksellers and Amazon. Uh, really, Amazon's probably one of the better places to go. And uh, I really urge you to get this book because we've got so much to talk about. And he's agreed that if we go too long, we're going to do a part two because it's just a really awesome story. So again, this is Matthew Bernstein, and he has written the book, George Hurst, The Silver King of the Gilded Age, and it's at Amazon and booksellers now. Um, where in this process of you hiking, teaching, traveling, bagging peaks, did your brain say, or did you see something about George Hurst that piqued your interest enough to really dive deeper? Like, what was the process? What happened? Okay, I'll tell you the uh, the origin story of how like oh. Hurst really uh, became a forest fire with me. So I was at uh, Victor Valley College, and this might have been like 2010 or so. I was uh, teaching there. Um, you're familiar with Wright Woods, you know, oh, yeah. uh, Victorville is up in I the I lived high in Desert. Victorville, yeah. Yeah, so I was teaching there. I was between classes. I was in uh, the Victor Valley College Library, just wandering around, and a book caught my eye. It was called Citizen Hearst. And... I had seen Citizen Kane and, you know, I knew that uh, Citizen Kane was largely based around the life of William Randolph Hearst, but I really didn't know too much about his life. And it was an intriguing cover and title, and I had a little bit of time, so I picked it up. And I was fascinated. I was hooked. Uh, The book is about a thousand pages long. Um, Over the course of just having breaks in the library, just that became the thing I did, and I finished it off in two mesmerized weeks. But something was nagging at me. Uh, you know, William Randolph Hearst's father is George Hearst, who was a prospector and a miner, and ultimately becomes one of the greatest miners in the country. But there's only like 30 or 40 or so pages that mention him. You know, he's kind of like a prologue character in his son's life story. So that nagged at me a little bit. And I started looking for other stories and other books on the Hearst family. And they were almost always biographies on William Randolph Hearst. And it was the same story. George would be mentioned for like 20 pages or 40 pages, sometimes a little bit more, sometimes a little bit less. But I couldn't really find his life story. And I eventually found a biography of George that was written in 1932 or so by friends of the Hearst family. So you could imagine they made George Hearst out to be the greatest thing since sliced bread. In fact, the only thing better than George Hearst, according to this biography, may have been William Randolph Hearst. You know, so you're just one, you're reading about what a, Wonderful, nice guy he was to everybody. Extremely charitable, never said a bad thing to anyone. You know, it's like, he's the cat's pajamas. And then, you know, you end up, uh, I had watched, uh, the series Deadwood on HBO. Um, and George Hurst is, you know, becomes the villain in season three. And I was like, how do you go from such a wonderful, nice guy to, one of the most uh, sadistic and evil guys we've seen on television as a villain. You know, like, where's the difference there? So ultimately, ultimately, I was able to track down George Hurst's 
40 page memoir at UC Berkeley. And it kind of gave a, a better indication of who he was because George didn't have the guile to sort of like hide his life. You know, when he explained what his life was, it was kind of warts and all. Um, but still 40 pages wasn't enough. So I came to the conclusion, either I'm going to wait around for a historian to figure out that George Hurst is a significant character and has got an interesting life story and write the biography I want to read, or I can do the mammoth amount of research and write the book myself. And so that's what I ended up doing. But when you wrote the book, I'm sure you began, because I ask this of a lot of historians, you began to unearth information that was not normally shared. Was there a reason for that? Because like you said, they painted him as this super wonderful guy. Like, why did they do that? And most of them, and I'm asking because I really don't know. And why do you think it was they painted him that way when the truth is sitting out there saying some of that could be true, some of that may be true, but there's another side of George we don't want to tell that side. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, the Hearst family, I mean, I'd say there's a, there's two reasons. Uh, one of them is that the Hearst family was very protective on George's image. And William Randolph Hearst was, you know, such a powerful media mogul, you know, the most powerful in his lifetime, uh, that he could really uh, stop people you know, from writing so much about George. The second reason is that William Randolph Hearst, you know, ended up mildly eclipsing his father, where William Randolph Hearst was running for president. He was running around with multiple women. He's building this uh, extravagant castle atop a hill in San Simeon, California. Uh, he's collecting you know, something like a fifth of the medieval antiquities world. You know, he's got castles all over the place. Uh, one of the things he did is he helped FDR get elected. Um, you know, it, William Randolph becomes a, such an extraordinary story himself that people kind of forgot that George Hearst himself was a United States senator, was, you know, possibly the greatest miner in the country. You know, so... So you it think it was a story that needed to be told. So you think that the family might have buried George's truth to so that it didn't maybe embarrass the Randolph? Yes. Yeah, uh they totally did. Like uh even uh George's memoirs. I mentioned the 40 page memoir that I found in UC Berkeley. Uh they had kind of printed up a sanitized version mm -hmm. of it. So most historians, if you were really curious about George Hurst, well, do you go to UC Berkeley and do you make, you know, the appointment to look into the Hearst papers? Or do you be like, oh, I can order off Amazon, you know, this book for $5. So most people would just order the book off Amazon. And now they're not actually reading what George Hurst wrote. It appears it is, but they've kind of like... Uh, They've sanitized it. They've changed some of the words um, and the meanings. Because George was, correct me if I'm wrong, and I, I tell every historian, please do. Born in Missouri, oh. becomes a prospector, or ra born and raised in Missouri, from Missouri. Um, prospecting ends up owning several of the most productive mines in the world. You, you don't, and then on top of that, becomes a U.S. senator. Before I get into the marriage to Phoebe, he, like, you don't become this mogul being Mr. Nice Guy. Right. Yeah, he was, uh, he was not quite as much of a robber baron as, say, J.D. Rockefeller or Leland Stanford. But he did a lot of shady stuff. Um, if George Hurst is in your mining town, you know, like uh, whether it's Deadwood, Tombstone, Pioche, what have you, there's going to be lawsuits because, you know, like 
part of the Gilded Age was, you know, everyone was suing everybody. And when George Hurst showed up and he wants the biggest mine, uh, he's going to be treated as an invader uh, somewhat. And in the lawsuits, multiple times, when things don't look like they're going George Hurst's way, allegations of bribery are followed by suddenly things go Hearst's way. In other words, Hearst is able to bribe jurors. And he felt that was just the sort of thing a red-blooded American should be able to do. Um, so uh, there was a lot of instances like that where he was, uh, he was not the, uh, the nicest guy in the world. Um, going into uh, to the research a little bit, um, one of the things I was able to uncover at the uh, Huntington Research Library outside Pasadena uh, was a book written by a partner of George Hearst's during the gold rush. And the guy's name was Almarin B. Paul, and he was a writer as well. And he put this book of scrap, um, you know, all of his writings into a bank vault in San Francisco. And the bank was destroyed in the earthquake of 1906. And the book was singed from within the vault. And it somehow ended up in the Huntington Research Library. So when I found this book and I opened it up, and you know, it's like all birds and such, but everything inside is pristine. I was able to find uh, dozens of George Hearst stories, um, you know, where Almer and B. Paul and George Hurst were hanging out and had all the correct dialogue there. And I nearly whooped for joy. I was like, finally, the real story can be told. Because I'm going to ask you a question, maybe a statement. I've interviewed lots of older researchers and historians that are amazing. That all the research for their books were done by hand, by reading newspaper clippings, and by, um, you know, digging deep into county records and, and vaults and stuff like that. Your book was written in a period where you could have done everything off the internet and nobody would have known. And yet you did the exact opposite by going to the Huntington Research Library in Pasadena. Like, tell us about that because was that by choice that you wanted to dig deep? Because I, everybody that I, I interview says that we lose history sometimes we lose history sometimes or sometimes lose history by going off the internet because you type in a word and the search engine takes you right to it you could have done the same thing and you did the exact opposite you went down to the library and dug deep what was the reason for that well um yeah that's a fascinating uh, question because we're in a fascinating point of research history like right now um it's almost like a, a golden age because through the digitized newspapers, I can type in Hearst 1873, California, and suddenly, you know, because newspapers were tracking him because, you know, he was such a, a, a big mining baron, you know, like dozens to, you know, depending on the year, hundreds of uh, articles pop up and newspapers pop up from the San Francisco Chronicle to uh, the LA Times. And that makes it a great boon for the researcher. Um, you know, and you can find stuff that otherwise, if you were digging through old stacks of newspapers that you found in a swap meet or in a library um, or microfilm, mostly microfilm, which mm -hmm. I've done, you know, like it's painstaking because you've got to like search and search and you're looking for, you know, like stories about miners and such. And like, if you find Hearst after hours, one article, you're like, Oh my God, thank goodness. And then it says that uh, George Hearst showed up to this town and he didn't buy anything. And you're like, Oh, anyways. So the digitized newspapers helps tremendously, but yes, you do, you do lose stuff if that's the only thing you're going for. Um, one of the uh, reviewers for my book pointed out that uh, Bernstein, you know, like quotes articles from, I think it was the P.O. Herald. Uh, and he mentions that like the Herald only existed for a handful of years, you know, and it's not in the uh, digitized 
uh, newspapers. You know, I was able to find these on a hunch because I knew George Hurst had been there, that maybe he's mentioned in these newspapers. And he was, and it became a significant part of the biography. Um, yeah, you can't always just go off of, um, you know, the internet at this point. Also, you know, I, I felt I had to immerse myself in this guy. So I traveled to Deadwood twice. I traveled to St. Louis, Missouri, and went to Franklin County, where Hearst was born. Um, I went to Virginia City twice. Um, I went all through California. You know, like, I felt I really had to be walking in Hearst's shoes to get the idea of what was going on. And along the way, you end up picking up nuggets that you wouldn't have even imagined um, would have happened. Um, I've been talking a while, so I'll give a one mm. more anecdote before we swing it back to you, Mike. But there I am in Merrimack Cave, um, south of St. Louis. And, you know, I knew that Hearst had been around here. And, you know, the tour guide to the cave starts talking about um, during the Civil War, this was, you know, this cave was one of the places where the ore could be turned into munitions. So both the North and the South were desperate to seize this area, which was basically in Hearst's backyard, which was able to become a good backdrop to Hearst's actions during the Civil War. So it became uh, well worth it. And I would suggest that every researcher who's trying to write a biography or a history really gets their hands dirty. Well, first off, don't apologize for talking too long because if I, I sit, I, I sit here just as much as the listener does, and just I'm trying to absorb it all because <clears throat> you're doing things that are very old school. You know the fact that you traveled to these places and walked where they might have walked and got the feel that they might have gotten feel. It it literally says so much about you as a researcher. We've never met, but it says so much about you as a researcher because you. You put in the time to make sure that it is, it is as nearly as accurate as you can get. And like you said, it like I'm a places guy. So one of the places I want to go to um, is Piochi. Now, the reason I want to, not only because your book, but Peter Brand wrote a book. And one of the people, and I, I, I Peter, if you're listening, I'm so sorry. But one of the people, I think it was Johnny Tyler, actually was in that town. And it makes me want to walk those sidewalks and touch those buildings and say, you know, I, it's kind of like why people go to Tombstone, right? Because they're walking the area and walking the streets where Doc and Wyatt and everybody, and they get that feel and they become like, it's like a part of you. So it's, God, it's crazy. If you're, if you're wondering who I'm gushing over, um, <laughs> I'm gushing over um, Matthew Bernstein. He's written the book George Hurst, Silver King of the Gilded Age. Uh, you can find it on Amazon or booksellers near you. And, you know, if you can't find it uh, in booksellers, again, go back to Amazon. I think it's – is it available at A Books? I think uh, it's, yes. Yeah. Uh, Amazon, University of Oklahoma Press, various bookstores. There you go. And so you're going to want to get this book and add it to your collection. It's around, what, 275 pages, 274 pages. Um, so it's a great read. It's going to be jam-packed. You guys are going to love it. And wait till you see the cover. The cover is just, it's a beautiful cover. The artwork is just phenomenal. Um, uh, go ahead. Oh, I was going to mention something about the uh, cover. Yeah, um, I want to ask you about that because it's, so, it's a crazy cover. Yeah. Yeah, the cover is really entertaining. It's got a uh, George Hurst and he's smoking a gar, uh, smoking a gar, smoking a cigar, which he loved to do and which would eventually kill him. And it was from a uh, sitting he did when he was a senator in Washington, D.C., um, you know, where, you know, they want to take your portrait and Phoebe and the family, you know, want, you know, like classy photos of George. So the scandal arises where George doesn't want to stop smoking his cigar for the photo. And for a lot of uh, East Coast fellows, this is shocking. You know, so newspaper articles come out afterwards. You know, some people saying that, like, 
this is just kind of like the worst form ever, you know, like here we've got this like uncouth Westerner who, you know, has got a cigar in his mouth and other people are saying, well, it wouldn't be true to life if George didn't have the cigar in his mouth. Um, now, where can we see this uh, photo today other than on the cover of my book in Hearst Castle? If you go to Hearst Castle and you take the tour that uh, puts you up to uh, George Hearst's bedroom. Um, he's got a couple uh, framed photos there. One is of Phoebe, Phoebe and one is of George um, smoking the cigar. But in the cover on this picture is not just a man, but you the graphics behind it is money. Like... It's well. It's, it's uh, smart. It's, it's silver a, and gold. Silver, but it's smart. It's a smart cover. It's it. The picture is there, but there's also like a backside meaning. Like when I look at it, there's a backside meaning to the cover. Yeah, I see what you mean. Kind of like the uh, in in the lettering George Hurst. You can almost see uh, money behind that. Yes, and. You know, because he's the Silver King of the Gilded Age, it's kind of got like a mix of uh, silver and gold yes. um, behind him, and you know, it's uh, it's got some film noir elements, even though it's uh, before that time. Like it's a uh, black and white at points and in color and others. So yeah, they did a tremendous job. Yeah, beautiful cover. When let's talk a little bit about his 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 wife, because okay, it's. Her name was Phoebe, um, but it was a, she, that's his cousin. Phoebe was his cousin. I'm trying to look for the word that would describe. Uh, cousin's uh, cousin. They cousin. were related, but uh, somewhat distantly. It was, did, it, did it create a family stir or did anybody care? Uh, it created a stir, not in the fact that they were distantly related, the uh, the stir was over the discrepancy in age. Uh, it was about, George was about 40 and she was about 18 when they began courting. Um, now, also the, uh, the families were very close. Uh, when she was born, she was named Phoebe Elizabeth Apperson. And the Elizabeth was for George Hurst's mother, uh, Elizabeth Hurst. Um, so you can imagine how close the families were. Right. Um, at one point, uh, Phoebe's father was working for George's father. You know, in fact, uh, William Randolph Hurst is named after both of his grandparents, um, which would be uh, William Hurst and Randolph Apperson. Right. Mm. So, yeah, there was a lot of interconnection. Also in the, uh, the story, of George Hurst, he goes to the gold rush with his brother or with his cousins, uh, J.C. Clark and Joseph Clark, uh, who are also cousins to Phoebe. So there's a lot of interconnectedness. But the uh, the kind of shock was like, okay, Phoebe was a school teacher in Franklin County, and she was very intelligent and very cultured. Uh, she was the type of person that was writing poetry, which she often did. Um, and she had ambitions that wanted to take her all over the country and all over the world, which she eventually would get to. Um, and she had suitors. And, you know, Randolph, you know, would uh, mention later, like, oh, yeah, you know, so-and-so came over and he was wearing his best duds. It was just killing. Um, and the family was more inclined to let Phoebe uh, marry one of those fellows. But George Hurst shows up uh, right before the Civil War begins in 1860. He's been in the Wild West since 1850. He's left for a full decade. He comes back and he had owns a very productive farm in uh, Franklin County um, when he left. But now he comes back. And not only has he done fairly well, it's been a little bit rocky in California, but he has made himself a millionaire through Virginia City Silver, uh, Virginia City, Nevada. And 
he's showing off his wealth and he also comes back because his mother is sick. She's dying of tuberculosis and it's been 10 years. He doesn't want her to die while he's living it up in the wild west. And while he's there, you know, he's 40 years old. Now he's got the money that he really wants a wife because he can, you know, afford one. So, and also one of the things about California gold rush, which was uh, sad for uh, many young men who went West was there was a striking dearth of women, you know, like uh, it wasn't like it is today. Like it was mostly the young men who went West. Um, so there weren't a lot of people for him to court. So he comes back home. He uh, goes to a picnic with Elizabeth. Uh, they hit it off. Um, her parents don't like it one bit. She does. It's They're both very practical-minded. Uh, so there's the idea of like, okay, if I die before you, you get to be deeded uh, this mining stock. You know, that kind of helps the cause. Um, their uh, parents don't show up to the wedding. Um, Phoebe sews her own wedding dress. Uh, they get married at a friend's house. And by this time, the Civil War has begun. Um you know, so now they've got to get out of Missouri. They've got to get back to California. So it takes George a long time, but he finally finds an old friend who gives him a pass uh, to get through the lines to get to New York City. And they take a steamer uh, to Panama. Then they have to go through the isthmus of Panama. And on the other side, they're heading to California. Phoebe makes a friend on the ship. Um, who thinks Phoebe is very seasick because she's been vomiting, you know, and gets her some tea. And the fact of the matter is that Phoebe is not seasick. In reality, she's pregnant, and she's pregnant with William Randolph Hearst, and that'll be the uh, formation of the uh, Hearst dynasty. That is crazy, crazy stuff. Oh, yeah. When I, I yeah. want to I go back a little bit, um, before we move forward, I want to talk about the bribing of jurors. And the reason I ask that is in multiple reads, like somebody goes online, they type in silver king of the Gilded Age. <clears throat> it brings up, you know, Goodreads, Amazon, and all these reviews. And literally in every review, it says bribing of jurors. What was that about? Go ahead. I lost you for a second, Mike. Oh, in every review that I've read online about the book, Silver King of the Gilded Age, mm -hmm. there is mention of bribing of jurors. It, can you expand on that? Because I'm curious as to why that was always mentioned on, in every review is bribing of jurors. Okay. Well, one of the more fascinating uh, aspects of Hearst's life is the period when he was in the Black Hills, when he was in uh, Deadwood and Lead. And I assume, Mike, you've been to Deadwood a number of times? Yes. Yeah. A fascinating place, you know, you being you, you'd have uh, gone and seen uh, the graves of Calamity Jane yes. and Wild Bill Hickok. Yep. Right? Probably, probably several others. Um, anyway, so, you know, like the... Uh, the show Deadwood and their subsequent uh, movie to kind of finish it off that they did about a dozen years uh, after season three, you know, has George Hearst in this uh, this amazing role as, you know, like the villain. He's basically the fire breathing dragon that settles over this medieval town, to use this analogy, and demands gold and tribute before he'll go away. And he's he's all powerful. He's hired gunmen and Pinkertons. Um, he's got extraordinarily cool lines. He himself is very violent. Uh, you know, it's a it's a fascinating thing to watch. So people interested in George Hearst, you know, are, are also, you know, along with Hearst Castle and the gold rush and uh, politics, you know, they kind of want to know, like, all right, what was he actually doing in the Black Hills? What's the real story of what Hearst was doing in Deadwood? And I devote a couple chapters to it. And, you know, one of them 
shows the nitty gritty of how he went ahead and got a hold of the biggest minds in the hills. And you don't have as many characters in the show uh, interacting with Hearst. You know, uh, Seth Bullock, who's a friend of Theodore Roosevelt's, Al Swearingen, who's a, another villain in the show, various other people. But what you do see is George, you know, like using machinations to get what he wants. Um, and then you kind of get the story of like, okay, here we go. If, you know, you were looking for kind of like the, uh, the wild west story of it is story goes in 1879. Um, Hearst mine is butting up against, uh, another mine. Um, the pride of the West is the rival mine and the Homestake mine, which is Hearst's biggest and most lucrative gold mine is right next door. And there's kind of some uh, overlap on one of the mine shafts. And, you know, there's a bit of a, there's a bit of a tussle where the police get involved. And at one point the shaft is boarded up and one of Hearst's men, Sam McMaster, goes to, uh, uh, unboard it and people pull some pistols and some people get arrested. And then you're a little bit later and now McMaster has pulled um, and McMaster's working for Hearst. He's pulled his four best gunmen and his foreman and marches on down to this uh, contentious mine shaft. And the Pride of the West men have more men than the Hearst men, and no one's backing down. And at some point, one of the Hearst men who's are in a uh, in a cabin um, squeezes the trigger of a gun. And one of the Pride of the West men, Alex Frankenberg, is shot in the neck. Hmm. And at this point, the Pride of the West men storm the cabin, and some of the Hearst men escape. No more shots are fired. Uh, but by the next day, all of the Hearst men are in jail. Okay, so Hearst does what any CEO of a company should do, especially back then. He leaves San Francisco, he boards a train, and he goes directly to the Black Hills to try to get his boys out of jail and to oversee what's going on. Obviously, things have gone too far and are spiraling out of control. And Hearst was considered, uh, he's a stabilizing f- force. You know, he's the guy you really want his boots on the ground when things go wrong. Uh, so he gets there, and at this point in time, between criminal and civil lawsuits that are unrelated to the murder trial, because Frankenberg will, uh, his neck will hemorrhage and die like the next day, um, Hearst has got something like 40 lawsuits against him. Mm-hmm. And he's able to weave through those eventually, mm-hmm. hiring all sorts of lawyerly talents uh, from the Hills and from uh, San Francisco. Um, but he's also overseeing uh, the murder trial. And uh, Hearst men, there's three of them on trial, they could easily um, be uh, sentenced to hang. Um, so he uses a trick that he used uh, in Nevada before, where he bribed jurors in Pioche. I think you pronounce it Pioche. I always yeah. thought it was Pioche. Yeah, uh, no. You, you got to hear Peter Brand say it, because with the Australian accent, it's perfect. <laughs> I'll give it a listen. Um, so Hearst in Kiosh in what was called the uh, Great Mining Suit had uh, bribed jurors. And it was one of those things that everybody knew it. People were saying he uh, he bribed them like, uh, like hot dogs. Um, he does the same thing, according to all the papers and all the historians that, you know, wrote about it uh, just later in the murder trial of Frankenberg where uh, Hearst men are set free because two fellows on the jury, they are, they're going to say innocent. Everybody else said guilty. Um, and the judge, who was a Civil War veteran who fought in the Bloody Ninth, Indiana, um, which was the same uh, infantry units that uh, Ambrose Bierce fought on, incidentally, um, he's incensed. Uh, he's enraged that the jury does this, and he has all the names of the jurors stricken from the record. And you know, he says something that, to the effect that 
if this is how law is handled, you know, in the Black Hills, then, you know, we're no better than barbarians. Mm. Um, anyways, that's, uh, that's one of the reasons it becomes such a, uh, such a wild story because we kind of see George Hurst, uh, overlapping the character, uh, that he was portrayed by Gerald McRaney as in, uh, the HBO show Deadwood. You know, like, mm-hmm. this is no longer what the Hearst family wanted to present and try to, of George Hearst was the nicest guy you had ever met. It's like, well, no, George Hearst has a pretty rough edge and he will do everything he can to get what he wants, uh, despite where the law would want it to head. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's crazy. I love that. Mm-hmm. We got about 15 minutes, about 10 minutes, actually. Okay. You working on anything new? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. University of New Mexico will be uh, publishing Hanging Charlie Flynn hmm. uh, uh, next October. I'm really looking forward to that. I'm also about three quarters the way through a new history of the Spanish-American War. Um, this one is not... Uh, it's not really a Wild West story, though it's got elements of it. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt uh, is one of the main characters. And the Rough Riders, you live in Arizona. You're probably aware that the Rough Riders had a whole lot of Arizonans uh, in there. Mm-hmm. And they were almost all Westerners. Um, so uh, along with the uh, the schoolwork and the hiking, uh, that's been keeping me busy. You're kind of a lazy bum. That's all you got going on. <laughs> uh, is it all all fiction? Are you do you strictly do you strictly only write fiction, or do you write nonfiction as well? Um. Oh, it's all uh, it's all nonfiction. The uh, the George Hurst story. I mean, nonfiction. Uh, That's what I meant. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I was fascinated in college by film noir and hard boiled literature, and I still. Uh, on my commutes, I'm listening to uh, usually hard fantasy, uh, the sort of stuff like A Game of Thrones oh, or okay. uh, Joe Abercrombie's The uh, Age of Madness. Um, and, you know, like I go see Shakespearean plays. I love stuff with like politics and fantasy or swords and sorcery and in- intrigue. Gotcha. Um, so, you know, I feel that. Uh, but to answer your question. It turned out uh, I was in a different genre than the one that was a natural fit for me. Um, somehow, uh, somehow I developed a, a voice and the research skills to make uh, nonfiction Western history lively, entertaining, and informative. Uh, Where if I'm like, hey, I'm going to write a story about a pirate who goes on a quest to get some treasure, you know, like, you know, that I'm just creating in my head. It doesn't really resonate as well. Right. And I feel I'd kind of be spinning my wheels if I spent uh, my time doing that. And also, there are plenty of great fantasy writers who do that sort of stuff. Well, I think you like historical accuracy. Oh, yeah. Is there anything about you that we don't know? Meaning, here it is. I, I like fried pickles, and <laughs> I used to work at Wendy's as a kid, yeah. and I will sometimes do it, and people are going to be like, "Us, oh, the grossest thing ever." It's gross until you try it. I will dip Wendy's French fries into a chocolate frosty, and it's pretty damn uh-huh. good. It, you think it sounds horrible, but it was pretty damn good. Is there something about Matt Bernstein that we don't know something you got a favorite favorite food you like, or, you know, if I share this, I'm going down. Oh, uh, one of my favorite things to do, which I do every so often is I make a brisket. Um, and I host a risk game, um, in Reseda where I live, uh, usually once a month. Um, so, I like making my briskets, uh, you know, like uh, the sauce, you get uh, brown sugar, ketchup, uh, chili sauce, 
um, the rub. You get celery seed, dry mustard. Um, you got to get liquid smoke. Liquid smoke is kind of like the key ingredient to anything to make make it give it that smoky barbecue feel. Um, pepper, chili powder. You know, you uh, you cook it for nine hours in a slow cooker. Uh, you know, kind of like uh, turning it over every so often. Um, usually comes out great. You know, and that's a uh, one of my great loves of life. Well, if you're wondering, we're talking to Matthew Bernstein's cooking show. No, it's not true. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're talking to Matt Bernstein. He is the writer, researcher, and historian of George Hurst, Silver King of the Gilded Age. You can find it at booksellers, Amazon, A Books, anywhere that you buy books. And so make sure you get this, and you're going to want to read it. Like I said, the 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 cover of the book is fantastic, beautiful cover, very crisp, clear, very just wonderful graphics. It's just really a beautiful cover. Um, so you want to get this when you read it. It's about 274, 275 pages. It's going to be a great read, packed full of information. And uh, again, um, yeah, just a, a great, I appreciate the interview. Um, do you have a website? Yes, no, no, yes. No, I have a Facebook page and uh, on Amazon, I've got like a, an author page going. Gotcha. At some point, uh, probably before Hanging Charlie Flynn comes out, I might actually put together a website. Okay. But you can, if you want to, if people had questions, they could, could connect with you on, on Facebook, correct? Absolutely. All right. So go do that. Um, I think that's it. I think that's, I mean, it just, it's just fascinating. Um, are you, do you plan on doing anything since you've, and I'm going to say this because it might be since there's so many books about William Randolph Hearst, are you going to stay away from that part of it? Or is it, is there something in your head that says I've uncovered so much about George that it, it's going to kind of transcend into William Randolph at, at some point, or are you staying away from it? Oh, uh, well, I told you about the Spanish American War book and Teddy Roosevelt's one of the main players, but so is William Randolph Hearst. And I, I uncovered so much new stuff on William Randolph Hearst as I was doing the George Hearst biography that it had no business really being in the George Hearst biography. Like mm -hmm. you don't, if it's a biography on George Hearst, you can't overstuff it with another character. There's mm -hmm. a lot of William Randolph stuff in there. But, you know, sort of like the nitty gritty of like William Randolph Hearst's first year running the San Francisco Examiner, you know, like everywhere he goes, the people he talks to, um, you know, some of that stuff that makes uh, it makes a difference in William Randolph Hearst build up to the Spanish American War, but wasn't part of the George Hearst story. So, yes, absolutely. Um, I'm still with the Hearst family. Um, I took a break when I did my Highwayman story um, that'll be out next year, but um, now I'm back in the Hearst game. Well, don't stay out of it too long because I think it's, I think you've got you got a momentum going, you got some energy going, and I think that would make just another addition. They would actually complement each other. Um, again, oh, yeah. we're talking to Matthew Bernstein. He is a writer, researcher, historian, um, and amazing cook and PCT Pacific Coast Trail hiker. Um, he's written the book, George Hearst, the Silver King of the Gilded Age. I want to thank my friends at the Tombstone Epitaph, Arizona, Arizona's longest running newspaper. Uh, so make sure you subscribe and get the, uh, the paper delivered right to your door. Mark and Eric are just cranking it out and they're doing a phenomenal job. And you can subscribe at tombstoneepitaph.com and all my friends and family, second family, uh, over at the uh, Wild West History Association, you can uh, uh, join and become a member by going to wildwesthistory.org, as well as their YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook page. There is so much going on from history, whether you want to deep read it, research it, find out more, or you just want some pictures and a quick a quick look into history, you can do so on their Instagram. If you're looking for something in between, uh, deep dive and some pictures, go check out the Facebook page. Uh, and I'm, you'll see tons of content in there from me. And then also, uh, 
YouTube. You can find it YouTube at Wild West History Association. And for me, you can find me on Facebook and Instagram and YouTube. You can find my podcast at YouTube by uh, looking through, uh, looking for Cochise County underscore travels. Make sure you hit the subscribe or follow button or connect, whatever it is, and leave a, li- a, a rating and review. So if you're listening to these podcasts on iTunes or Spotify or Stitcher or iHeartRadio, wherever it is, Give a rating and review. It really helps with distribution. As always, I appreciate you guys a bunch.